you will hear a number of different recordings, and you have to answer questions on what you hear. There'll be time for you to read instructions and questions. And you have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played only once. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a conversation between a student and a railway clerk. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Central Station, Norwich, Sue Brown speaking. Can I help you? Is that the railway station? Yes. Uh, is there a card that you can buy railway tickets and allows you to get discounts on it? You mean a rail card? Yes, there are various types. There's the young person's rail card and the senior citizen's rail card, for example. Well, I'd like a young person's rail card, but I'm over 21. Is that OK? Do I still qualify? Yes, you're eligible from 18 to 25. Great. And how much does it cost? 18 pounds. OK. And can I get it over the phone? Well, I can take your details and process it now over the phone, but you'll need to come in to collect the card. Yeah, that's fine. OK. So I just need to take down some details. First of all, can I have your name? Stephen Crockers. OK, so first name Stephen. Is that Stephen with a V? No, with PH. Right. And can you give me your surname again? That's Crockers. Crocker with a C? No, I'll have to spell it out for you. K-R-O-C-K-E-R-S. Right, thank you. Now, you said you were over 21. Can I ask for your exact date of birth, please? Yes, sure. It's the 3rd of February. Yes? And the year's 1979. 1979. OK, lovely. So the next thing I need to know is your permanent address. Right. I'd better give you my parents' address then. I'm probably moving soon. Yes, that'll be fine. It's 158 Kingwood Close. Is Kingwood one word or two? One. Right. Norwich. And can you tell me the postcode, please? It's NR46JF. NR46JS? No, F for Freddy. Right. And the next thing I need is your telephone number. Do you mean my parents' number? Yes, the number at your permanent address. OK. It's Norwich 456321. And are you living at that address now? No, in term time I'm in lodgings. But like I said, I might be moving soon. Never mind. Just give me the address where you're staying now. Right. It's 62 Housewalk Terrace, Wakefield. And the postcode? WF14NN. Right, that's fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. And I want to get a ticket. Can I do that now and get the discount or do I have to wait until the card's ready? No, you can book the ticket now and collect it at the same time as you get the card. OK, so I want to return ticket to London next week. How much will that cost? Well, it depends on what sort of ticket you get. There are four different kinds. I'll go through them for you. Right. The cheapest one's the London Day Out. That's good if you're just going away for the day. It includes some bus and tube travel in London. But you have to travel outside peak hours. That costs £18. OK. Now, the next one's called the Super Advance Return. You can travel on any train with that, but you have to book your seat one day ahead. Actually, it's better to book earlier if you can, because there's only a limited number of tickets. OK, and how much is that? It's £23. Now that doesn't sound too bad. 
What about the other types of tickets? They're more expensive. There's one called the Saver, which again you can use on most trains outside peak hours. That's twenty nine thirty. But you don't need to buy it in advance. You can get it on the day you travel. Hmm, that's a bit expensive. And finally, there's the open ticket, and with that you can travel on any train on any day of the week, and you don't need to book ahead. But that costs sixty pounds. Sixty pounds? Right. I'll have a super advance. Now I'd like to leave next Friday morning on the eight thirty train and come back on Sunday at ten p.m. And he said that usually costs twenty-three pounds. That's right. So how much do I save with the rail card? You get a third off. A third off, twenty-three pounds is seven pounds sixty-six. So you'll pay fifteen thirty-four. But then this time you have to pay for the rail card too. That's fifteen thirty-four plus eighteen pounds. So altogether you'll have to pay thirty-three pounds thirty-four. And when can I collect them? They'll be ready by Wednesday. They should be at the bookings office after about ten a.m. Oh, I don't know if I can make it on Wednesday. You can't post them, can you? No, you have to collect your rail card in person and sign it. And I nearly forgot to tell you, you need a passport-sized photograph for it. If you don't have one, there's a machine on the station. No, I think I've got one somewhere. I needed some for my college application. I think I had one left over. Good. So, is there anything else? No, that's great. Thanks a lot. Bye. Goodbye. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a talk to new students at a university. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to thirteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to thirteen. Hi, it's good to see you all here today. And what a pity the weather is so bad for your first day at university. It could at least have stayed sunny today. Now, my name is Pat Baker. I work for Student Services, and I'm going to tell you about our mentoring scheme for new students. We've had it in place for a few years now, and people starting at university for the first time in general. Find it a very positive experience at these meetings. What happens is this: each of you, if you want to join the scheme, will be assigned a mentor, that is, someone who's been studying here for a year or two, and who can show you the ropes. In other words, show you how things work, give you advice if you need it, and just generally be friendly contact for you in the university. Of course, you'll have your tutors and lecturers who will also help you with academic problems. But this is someone more your own age who has been through the same experience quite recently. What the mentor does is to have a group of usually two or three students, and he or she organises meetings, preferably about once every two weeks. We generally find that more than that is just too often, where you chat about your problems, university life, or just about things in general, and your mentor will give you the benefit of his or her experience. If you're joining this scheme, you'll be meeting your mentor today, just after lunch. If you haven't signed up, by the way, it's not too late. Come and see me after the talk. Don't be frightened about this first meeting. It's going to be quite short, so you won't have time to tell your mentor all your difficulties. You'll just get to know each other a little bit, and most importantly, fix a time and a place for your next meeting. Which you can have when you're feeling more relaxed and not so overwhelmed by the newness of it all. Before you hear the rest of the talk, 
You have some time to look at questions 14 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 14 to 17. Mentors, as I've said, have been through the same experience as you quite recently, so they can understand your problems. They'll be able to tell you about academic systems, which are so different at university from what you were used to at school. Also, because at university you are much more independent and you have to spend so much time studying on your own, they can suggest techniques for studying which will help you to keep up to date with your work. This university is an enormous place, so another thing which they'll be able to help with is university facilities. You know, anything from sports halls to libraries to medical services, and they can probably help you get involved in all sorts of social activities too. Parties, clubs, sports, whatever. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 18 to 20. So, as you can see, this is a pretty useful scheme, but it does rely on people keeping in touch. The telephone's pretty useful if you have one, but students are busy people and often out doing things, so email is probably better. Your mentor will be able to show you how to get an email account. They don't cost anything to students, they're free. For people who have never been away from home before, a mentor is a useful contact and support, somewhere between a friend and a parent. And no doubt, as the year progresses, and you start getting nervous around exam time, your mentor will be ready with useful tips on the best way to pass your exams. After all, they did the same ones either last year or the year before, and they passed them. That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a radio program in which a researcher talks about stress at work. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. And now, after that old favorite from the course entitled, I Never Loved You Anyway, we have Dr. Greenhill to talk to us today about stress in the workplace. Is it getting worse, Dr. Greenhill? I'm not sure whether it's getting worse or just that more people are talking about it. Certainly more people are complaining about it. I've just completed a study of 5,000 workers from 20 different countries, and I've taken a multicultural approach to the subject. And what have you found? That, broadly speaking, the causes of stress are similar all over the world. For example, Raymond from Mexico City says that society measures people by individual success. But, he says, increasingly work is organized in teams. This means there is a conflict between personal goals and the need to cooperate with one's colleagues. He finds this an acute source of stress, actually. Then there's Kikuko, 
from Osaka, Japan, who says she's under a lot of stress because the company she's worked for for 30 years is in difficulties. She says it's because her bosses made a number of bad decisions. But really what worries her most is that she might lose her job. You know, she's in her 50s, and at that age, it's not easy to find another one. She says that she also feels overworked, and that's getting her stressed out, too. Well, then there's Boris, from Odessa in the Ukraine. He puts overwork at the top of his list of stressors. Then there are other factors. Both he and his wife have full-time jobs, so that when they get home, they don't get to relax much either. I guess that's a problem most of us can relate to. We always hear about computers, email, and cell phones as things which get people tearing their hair out. Is this true? Mm, in many cases, yes, but not so much as you might think. Only 15% of respondents give this as their main cause. Etienne, from Quebec, Canada, is one. Though he also mentions change and the feeling of being a victim of circumstances beyond his control. Other people talk about the amount of work which comes with continual change as being more stressing than new technologies themselves. People feel they lack stability in their working life. But we must remember that in many places it's really lack of new technology that puts people under most pressure. Take Nagwa from Sohag in Egypt, for example. She says that for her the main source of stress was working in noisy, hot, unventilated conditions day out, and with no end in sight. So it seems we can't win either way. Before you hear the rest of the program, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 25 to 30. So, what can we as individuals do to make things easier for ourselves? Well, I've talked to a number of specialists about this, doctors and psychologists. And here are a few suggestions for reducing stress without you having to change your job. First, vary your diet. Fish, pasta, vegetables, fruit, and so on. Try not to live off sandwiches and fast food. A balanced diet, in other words. Also, we tend to drink too much coffee. Caffeine, the drug in coffee, gets us more nervous. So if you want to feel less stressed, drink less coffee. It's tough at first, but you'll notice the difference within just a few days. Finally, take regular exercise. It's a great way of relaxing, and of course, it makes you more healthy too. For particular cause of stress, there are various things you can do. If your problem is that you think you've got too much work on your plate, what you probably need to do is to manage time better. You have to learn to deal with the things which are really vital. Don't waste time on trivialities. There are courses to help you with this. If you are worried about unemployment, make plans so that if it happens, you are ready for it. Do things like set money aside and update your CV so it's attractive to new employers. As for new technologies, do training courses so that you feel at home with them and so that you don't feel frightened of them. So in the end, the best way to deal with stress is for you to take control of your life and not allow yourself to be a victim of circumstance. Thank you, Dr. Greenhill on fighting stress. And just when you thought you could relax, Here's Dolly Parton, working 9 to 5. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. 
you will hear an extract from a lecture about solar eclipses in history. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 36. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 36. Good evening and welcome to this month's Observatory Club Lecture. I'm Donald Mackey and I'm here to talk to you about the solar eclipse in history. A thousand years ago, a total eclipse of the sun was a terrifying religious experience. But these days, an eclipse is more likely to be viewed as a tourist attraction than as a scientific or spiritual event. People will literally travel miles to be in the right place at the right time to get the best view of their eclipse. Well, what exactly causes a solar eclipse? When the world goes dark for a few minutes in the middle of the day, Scientifically speaking, the dark spot itself is easy to explain. It is the shadow of the moon streaking across a different and, to all intents and purposes, a seemingly random part of the globe. In the past, people often interpreted an eclipse as a danger signal heralding disaster, and in fact, the Chinese were so disturbed by these events that they included among their gods whose job was to prevent eclipses. But whether or not you are superstitious or take a purely scientific view, our earthly eclipses are special in three different ways. Firstly, there can be no doubt that they are very beautiful. It's as if a deep blue curtain has fallen over the daytime sky as the sun becomes a black void surrounded by the glow of its outer atmosphere. But beyond this, total eclipses possess a second more compelling beauty in the eyes of us scientists, for they offer a unique opportunity for research. Only during an eclipse can we study the corona and other dim things that are normally lost in the sun's glare. And thirdly, they are rare. Even though an eclipse of the sun occurs somewhere on earth, if you sit in your garden and wait, it will take 375 years on average for one to come to you. If the moon were any larger, eclipses would become a monthly bore. If it were smaller, they simply would not be possible. The ancient Babylonian priests, who spent a fair bit of time staring at the sky, had already noted that there was an 18-year pattern in their recurrence, but they didn't have the mathematics to predict an eclipse accurately. It was Edmund Halley, the English astronomer, who knew his maths well enough to predict the return of the comet which incidentally bears his name. Before you hear the rest of the lecture, you have some time to look at questions 37 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 37 to 40. In 1735, Edmund Halley became the first person to make an accurate prediction of an eclipse. This brought eclipses firmly into the scientific domain, and they have allowed a number of important scientific discoveries to be made. For instance, in the eclipse of 1868, two scientists, Janssen and Lockyer, were observing the sun's atmosphere, and it was these observations that ultimately led to the discovery of a new element. They named the element helium after the Greek god of the sun. This was a major find, because helium turned out to be the most common element in the universe after hydrogen. Another great triumph involved mercury. I'll just put that up on the board for you now. See, there's mercury, the planet closest to the sun then Venus, Earth, etc. For centuries, scientists had been unable to understand why Mercury appeared to rotate faster than it should. Some astronomers suggested that there might be an undiscovered planet causing this unusual orbit, and even gave it the name Vulcan. During the eclipse of 1878, an American astronomer, James Watson, thought he had spotted this so-called lost planet. But alas for him, he was later obliged to admit that he had been wrong about Vulcan and withdrew his claim. 
Then Albert Einstein came on the scene. Einstein suggested that rather than being wrong about the number of planets, astronomers were actually wrong about gravity. Einstein's theory of relativity, for which he is so famous, disagreed with Newton's law of gravity in just the right way to explain Mercury's odd orbit. He also realized that a definitive test would be possible during the total eclipse of 1919, and this is indeed when the theory was finally proved correct. So there you have several examples of how eclipses have helped to increase our understanding of the universe. And now let's move on to the social. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of listening test, the IELTS test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.